So tonight, multi-group CFAs. But honestly, this could be multi-group anything. So we're just going to look at how do I do multi-group models in Lebon. Now, really, you know, when I use the term CFA here, it's really multi-group measurement models is what the focus of this is. But you can take this idea and how the code for how to do this and really apply it in, in nearly any type of model, uh, generally on the measurement model is the question. So what is a multi-group model? Well, I specifically want to start with the terminology that, that is used here because it's a little different than other ones. And so anytime someone says the model is invariant, or we're talking about measurement invariance, what they're essentially saying is it's equivalent. So two groups of people take the scale in the same way. So therefore, their answers on the measured items mean the same thing. If scales are not invariant, meaning that the two different groups interpret these things differently, or they have different, maybe even totally different measurement models, that implies that our interpretation of the scores has to be qualified for which group it is. So basically, under different conditions or different groups of people, do our measurements yield the same assessment of attributes? Or are those, there are somehow these underlying differences that we must account for? Generally, measurement invariance is considered a good thing because that implies that the, the scores that you get out of the scale, like if you total them or what, or what have you, um, mean the same thing for group one and group two. Now this doesn't mean that they have the same base level. It might, you know, your, your in groups inherently might have different scores. So men and women are going to score differently on the depression, anxiety, and stress scale. That's not what we mean. We mean that the underlying model shows the same patterns of data. And so for some reason, you, you might experimentally manipulate something and get different scores. But you got to know that the underlying assessment tool at its base does not automatically cause those differences. And everything we've done thus far has been a latent variable model on the covariances. We've imported a lot of co uh, correlation and covariance matrices. But multi-group models actually are also based on mean structure. And so we're going to add mean structure um, to our models here. You could add them to any model, actually, but mostly they're the, the focus is for multi-group models. And you can do as many as you'd like. So you might have 10 groups at a time, but you can't really compare. Like, it becomes a complex problem that way. So the best, generally, what people do is do two at a time. Okay. You don't have to. But when you start to get into these interpretations, it's a lot easier if you're comparing two of them at a time and not more than that. It's not a code limitation. This is a, a thinking limitation, really. And so mean structure in one of these models represents the intercept of a manifest variable. Remember that we are predicting the manifest variable in a measurement model. You said this latent variable causes the manifest variable. So we're saying manifest variable tilde y equals this latent variable. We calculate normally a, a loading on that, which is the slope. But that equation actually also has a y-intercept. So we normally turn it off and look at the standardized one. And so um, the y-intercept in a regression equation is the mean of y given no x variables or if x is somehow set to zero. And that's all we're calculating. Okay, so that mean structure represents those intercepts on our manifest variables or the actual mean on a latent variable. So it's our best guess for what someone's going to score on an item knowing nothing else. No, no other information. The mean is, a be is the best point estimate for normal continuous variables. And that's why we use them in t-tests and ANOVAs and all that kind of stuff to represent each group. Right? Our best guess is the mean. And so the best, 
Yes, and the latent variable model is the same way. It's the starting value for that manifest variable. Now use starting value here because we're going to talk next week about latent growth models, and we'll talk about increases and decreases. But it's uh, it's literally just the best estimate if there's no predictor. And then from there, the latent variable either causes that to go up or to go down. So for this particular participant, right, their latent, their latent variable um, may be low, so their score on that variable will be lower. But the, the mean is the best starting guess. Cool. Well, now we can estimate if those things are equal across groups. Before, we haven't used it much because we haven't really needed it. You can add it to any measurement model without multigroups just to look at what the uh, averages are. Now, latent mean, on the other hand, is the actual estimated score for that, for any particular data point participant. I use participant here because social scientist, but any, um, any row of data, right? And that's really cool. We have not talked about this at all, about how to get a number to represent that circle. There's no real number in the data set, sort of estimated based on the covariance structure. And so the latent means um, allow us to put a number to that uh, to that option. That's really cool. Okay. And so it's basically a weighted score of each of its manifest variables um, original value, what the what the person scored on that item or whatever the, the variable value is, times its path coefficient. And that's really important right there because um, do I talk about it here? I might talk about this a little bit later. But I'm going to go ahead and preview. That's really important, this piece, because what do we do normally with scales? We have somebody take them and you total them up. So you might create a sum score or you create an average score. I'm so guilty of this myself. We do this for most research where we just assume that every item has an equal weight to its latent variable, even though those of us who do structural models know this isn't true. Some items are better at representing the latent variable than others. They're better predicted by the latent variable, meaning they have higher um, standardized loadings, right? But you don't really know that when you're taking a scale. So like for the DAS, for example, you, you add up the depression items, you add up the stress items, right? Add up the anxiety items, ignoring the fact that some of those items are better for depression than others. Or you average them. Using this kind of coding system, we're actually going to account for the different path, COVID, uh, path loadings, the regressions, not regressions, I'm sorry, the, um, the loadings. Right, so that's standardized variable. And the function is lav predict. You can actually use base R as regular predict function, but um, lav predict works just as well, and that makes it clear that it's in the Levon package. So we'll look at how to calculate these at the end. So what questions can I answer with a multi-group model? Well, do all of the items act the same across groups? Or is there one item that just doesn't work for one of the groups? Is that factor structure the same across groups? That's actually the first question. Is the factor structure the same? Do we see the same patterns of questions loading on their factors? or measurement items pairing with their latent variables. Are those uh, loadings the same across groups? Or, you know, for men, is it really strong, but for women, it's really weak? Or vice versa. Then, are the latent means equal across groups? So do we see the same overall under, underlying latent score, or is one group higher than another? And so there's even more, but those are kind of the basic questions. And for me, this is such an interesting field to be in because you always have an interesting answer. If the model is invariant, that's awesome. We could talk about this scale shows invariance across these categories. If the model's not invariant, it's also interesting. Here are the items that don't show the same pattern for these two different groups. So we really got to keep in mind when we're interpreting this scale that this is happening. And a good scientist loves data that is 
interesting either way it turns out because it's equally publishable right if i want to be totally honest <laughs> we talk about the kind of publisher parish scenario they're both interesting answers it being invariant is good it being not invariant is um not desirable but interesting to know because then you can fix it or you can just at least account for that factor so let's talk about how to do that so the first thing we'll do is just test our regular measurement model this is kind of the first thing you always do <laughs> it's like does the measurement model work because if it doesn't a multi-group analysis is not going to save it the full structural model is not going to save it a bifactor model is not going to save it it needs the measurement model needs to run <laughs> minimally okay and it, hopefully it's a good model the models you know got a negative tli it's not worth running a multi-group model with so this step is often first in nearly everything we've talked about just because we've got to have good measurement models and then we can do these additional things to them so it's also the least restrictive model we're letting everyone in all groups welcome do whatever you're going to do and then the interesting thing about as you don't use the grouping variables here is if this model is bad now you have another way to explore the reasons why it's bad maybe it's bad equally for both groups then you're still stuck in the same place but maybe it's that for women this is a great model but for men this is a terrible model and that's the reason i have a bad model it's because there's these underlying group problems and then you start exploring why okay. and so starting with this tells me if if the multi-group steps might be appropriate or if now splitting the model in half is appropriate and seeing um, splitting it on its group and seeing maybe that's the problem so this to me analysis also gives you another avenue from which to explore why it's not working the second step we'll do is we'll test each group separately with that same CFA structure and if your first model is bad, it actually tells you to try this next. Either way. Because maybe the issue is that just one group's great, another group doesn't work. This is not an appropriate scale for them. Um, it does not work the same way. The loadings are all bad, whatever it is. In general, one expects to find that the fit indices will decrease when you split the data because we've taken a big data set and split it in half so you just kind of have you know unless you have really really big data but I have done these on models where we had like 13,000 participants but you know if I have a couple of hundred participants and I split it in half I'm now kind of working on the edge of what's good and um, there's just probably a little bit more error there and that's okay what you don't want to see here is that one group is okay and the other group is just totally not working okay. if that happens now start exploring why that one group is bad and then you wouldn't do anything else okay. if they're both kind of acceptable the model still runs and the fit indices are kind of close okay, there's no rule here then you can try a multi-group model because we haven't actually gotten to that step yet you know if one of them is really bad figure out like that is why your overall model doesn't work and start start you know seeing why it maybe is bad and that's what we were just saying the next step so we're going to talk a lot about food so i hope you've had dinner <laughs> the next steps is to start to what's called nest the models together we're going to structure this and it's not hierarchical it's not by factor so i'm going to use the word nest here um, these are similar in in idea to multi-level models but you can actually do multi-level levon so it's not a multi-level model it is a multi-group model so we're going to stack two models together and i'm going to describe this like pancakes <laughs> this analogy has always worked for me so hopefully it will work for you before what we did is we took all of the batter of both groups and pour them together so it's just one big huge mess of people then we had kids and one likes chocolate chip pancakes and one likes blueberry pancakes and you cannot mix the two together or they will just absolutely um, throw a fit and so we ran them separately 
Now what we're going to do is you've got leftover pancakes and you want breakfast, so you're going to stack those two things together. And we're going to see if we have the same pancakes. Okay, so they're like kind of on top of each other. Um, and what we're going to do is force them slowly more and more to look the same. Okay, so we're going to see if we can totally merge them together. But right now we're, start, we're starting with two totally separate pancakes that just happen to be sitting on the same plate. And we're going to use here Brown. This is the Applied Confirmatory Factor Analysis book um, that you've got some chapters on. Um, his terminology is the most popular form of terminology, but I will warn you that different people use different words here. And so I'm going to try to tie the words to the concept to help make this clear because the, the terms aren't always the most descriptive. And then I will also say that there are other steps that people do. But definitely this is some of the most popular like order and procedure to doing this. So what are all the possible things that we could do, that we could test? And you can kind of think of multi-group models like little bitty t-tests, many little bitty t-tests to determine if there are all the pieces are the same. So what are all the things we could we could test? Well, the whole thing, okay, the, is the whole model the same? Is the measurement picture the same? Or are there other variables that appear to be missing in one group and not the other? Okay. The loadings themselves, these are the regression weights. This is like their standardized all column where we look and we make sure they're above 0.3. The intercepts for each item, so we're adding mean structure here. The error variances, or just the variance in general, for an item. And that tells you something about the distribution of the data for each group. Right? Is one group more platykirchtic and one group more lectokirchtic? And if you're like, what are those words she just said? Is one group more flat, one group more skinny? Right? And their distributions. Right? They have the same spread and variance in the data. It could also be the factor variances are different in the data or those factor correlations. And last but not least, the factor means. So there are many places to test. Which ones should we test? So I'm mostly going to start at the top. These are, in, these are in order for a reason. So we're going to start with what's often called equal form. And I have an example kind of after we go through all of these terms instead of embedded because um, I think it helps to hopefully kind of conceptualize these first. So equal form is where we're going to start. So we've run each group separately. And now we've taken our two pancakes that are left over and put them on our plate. The more common name for this is configural invariance where we are testing if they have the same configuration. Is it the same measurement model for each group? If group one and group two separately run, look about the same, then this step doesn't tend to break. It actually tends to be good for you because now you've brought the sample sizes back together. So in one model, you have both groups and you get all of your sample back. You could technically skip the stuff before that, but if something blows up, it would have been better to look at it first separately. Okay. Now, we're not forcing any of our paths to be the same, so we work from least restrictive, most free, to most restrictive, most similar. Okay. And we're just putting both pancakes on the plate. We're not requiring them to be the same type. One can be blueberry and one can be chocolate chip. They don't even need to be the same ingredients, nothing. They just both need to be on the same plate. <laughs> okay. And this question really is, are these both pancakes? <laughs> okay, so we're forcing the model pictures to be the same for each group. And so it's the same, the reason for the name, equal form, uh, configural invariance comes from this idea that the models are of the same configuration. So this model will blow up when there are paths that are, generally the paths are missing for group. So let's say for one group you have this really strong um, correlated error that makes this one group really bad and this other group doesn't meet it. Okay. That's the kind of place that this will blow up. Or if there's a, a loading 
a set of loadings, probably rather, for one group that are effectively zero, but for another group they're very strong. In a, the overall CFA, you won't notice that. It'll average them out. But in your separate group model, you'll start to notice, and then when you put it together, this model will be bad. And we don't always tend to see this, but it can happen. The next step is called metric invariance. Not a very good name. Okay. And this is the, the question of factor loadings. So are those loadings of each item onto its latent variable, I use the word exact here, but are they the same enough that the model doesn't blow up? So now what we do is we're going to ask, um, we put both of them on the same plate. This is really asking if they're both pancakes. Okay. And we're just starting to say, you know, are they the same size? Or is one of them like really small, one of them is really large? So we're forcing um, those factor loadings to be equal and testing if that model fit is still good. Okay. If the factor loadings like for one are basically zero and the other one are, are not, this will be a very bad model. And so the step tells you if they have the same weights for each question. If one group the question is negative and for another group it's positive, this, this is essentially going to blow it up. And it's essentially like a t-test on each of those regression weights, but we do them all at once. So actually more like an ANOVA, I guess. If that works okay, we move on to scalar invariance. So scalar invariance um, is where we test the intercepts of each item. So do they have the same weight to their latent variable? Now, are they basically starting at the same point? Are there these underlying population differences in the, the scores? Okay. So remembering that the y-intercept is the mean, this is literally a bunch of t-tests. <laughs> okay. um, not mathematically. Um, so, you know, does group one have the same average for item one as group two? That question is a t-test question. But it, again, it does them all at once. And I would say if a model's going to break, it's going to be here usually. Okay. Because often they'll have the same kind of rough loadings. Right? If one's 0.4 and one's 0.6, it'll average out and still look okay. But um, I find in the many of these that I've done that this is the step that tends to break. I don't think it does in this example that we're doing for class today, but if it's going to break, it's going to be here usually. Usually, not always. Um, mostly because it's not that unusual for different populations of people to have different sort of baseline answers to questions. Right? So we know just socialization wise, if you pick a gender item, like gender, for almost any item, there could be inherent population differences there. Okay? No manipulation needed. Just the way that people interpret these questions is different. The way that we, you know, society-wise sort of socially interact is different. So there are just like things that could cause these differences. They have nothing to do with our measurement, but are really good to know <laughs> that on average, women tend to score lower on this item. And then we could maybe figure out why. But, you know, we should know this at a time. So this doesn't necessarily make the scale invalid. It just makes it a point for you to know that maybe the overall scores are lower for women because on average they start lower on these four items. If that model works okay, we can move on to strict factorial invariance. And these are the error terms or the residuals for the items. There is an argument over whether or not this step is worthwhile. I've seen some people saying it's too restrictive. Um, you know, this re requires the most equality constraints. So sometimes people do it, sometimes they don't. I think it's an interesting question, so I like to teach it. So um, back to our pancake example. In a strict factorial model, they must be the same pancake of the same type, the same ingredients, everything should match. Okay. For metric invariant, or for scalar invariance here, you know, if one of them is blueberry and the other one is chocolate chip, it's going to break down. 
this is like the chocolate chips need to be in the same place all the way throughout. So it's the same number of chocolate chips and they're all arranged in the same pattern. And I'm sorry if the pancake example doesn't work for you, but it's this idea that we want them, we're slowly getting more and more similar. We need these pieces to all match. And we're just testing um, which pieces match one at a time. Some sort of most important to less important. Right? It is most important they have the same configuration. And then the loadings tend to be the most the next most important step. And on average, do they start in the same place? And then last, do they have the same error variance? This seems like an odd question at first, right? But essentially, it's basically like, can I predict them at the same rate? Because you're essentially asking if the R squareds are the same, because R squared is sort of one minus error variance. Right? Um, but for me, the more interesting part of this is the spread of the data. We can have two groups that show the same mean but one of them when they answer questions um, uses more of the scale and we actually see this on um, on a scale that we published and we wrote about the resiliency scale which we'll use in our examples here where some groups are just more likely to use the full one to seven range and other groups are less likely they have the same mean, let's say the mean is four. It's just that one group uses only three through five. Okay, pretty much nobody answers anything but three through five. The other group answers like two through, what would that be? <laughs> two through six, right? They're using more of the scale. So that tells me that there's a lot more variability in one group than another. Okay, and that implies some really interesting ideas. Like why is there more variability in this group? What is the underlying reason for that variability. Um, so that actually argues for heterogeneity between groups. Okay. And this is a thing that we normally test for in like ANOVAs and t-tests to determine, make sure it isn't affecting our results. This is a, a more um, complicated way, I guess, to test heterogeneity, but you're kind of asking if they have the under, same underlying variances after accounting for loadings and intercepts and um, configuration. All right, some other things that you can do. That is the normal sort of applied steps. Some other things that you can test are on the structural component of the model or the higher order component of the model. Everything that we've just discussed is on the manifest variables. Okay. So that's a good place to stop and focus because that's what is impacting the output of the scale that you see right we're writing down the numbers so i'm interested in are these numbers the same for everybody um so I, i'm mostly interested in that manifest level but you can also test for what's called population heterogeneity by instead looking at equal factor variances so do the latent variables have the same variances, okay. which implies that overall between groups, the kind of global score has the same spread of data. Equal factor covariances is the correlation between factors the same for each group and latent means. And generally people pick a side. They do the, the sort of measurement variable side or they do the latent variable side. You don't tend to do both. Although you could, I guess. There's no reason why you couldn't in Levon. It's just that people don't. So we've talked about this is sort of a step down procedure, much, much like MTMM, but we're comparing one step to the next. So how do I judge if my steps are equivalent? This is actually an interesting question right now because there's a lot of publications sort of testing this idea. I made um, some cool friends at a conference that have written some really neat papers on this. Um, I'm going to tell you the traditional way and then warn you that people are arguing about this right now, probably in their sleep, writing arguments about this uh, exact question. Um, because 
as I go, I'm adding more and more equality constraints. I'm making my pancakes look the same and we're being more restrictive. So we expect the fit of the model to get worse because the more parameters that you allow yourself to estimate, the better you'll fit the data. Right? More predictors, we're just going to get a better picture of the model. And the question here is, do we need all those predictors? And so we could actually use the change in chi-square from one model to the next, but it has the, all the same trappings as the regular chi-square, where, you know, um, sample size affects the analysis, and it almost always says they're always they're significant. And in this scenario, we want something that's a little less sensitive and is more sensitive to global change. Right? And so there's suggestions on the change in size for REMC, but I would say that the one that people have latched on to, myself included, include a change in size for CFI. We actually used that last week for multi-group, uh, MTMM. And the suggestion is the same, that if CFI's change is greater than 0.01, so if it's 0.011 or 0.0101, <laughs> greater than 01, there is a difference in fit. I usually do this to three decimals. So if the CFI for one model is 0.9 and the CFI for the next model is 0.889, that's a difference in fit. I say that they're equivalent right at 01, just to make this clear, greater than 0.01. Um, the, some of the newer ways adjust based on the um, my my like very brief understanding is that they adjust based on kind of your expectations for the model. And so um, there are newer, cooler rules for this, but the most common one you'll see is a CFI one. And I don't know that they've finished fighting about this rule just yet. So okay, I'm running my model. I'm looking at my pancakes. I'm eating them. Right? What do I do if I realize, oh no, I got walnuts. I do not like nuts. Mm -mm. Nope. Walnut pancakes. Why did I get the walnuts? Right? What do I do if I realize that I was eating chocolate chip pancakes and magically one of them is walnuts? <sighs> so basically what happens if these are not invariant? Well, what you can try is say, well, maybe they're mostly invariant, but there's like these one or two items that are the problem. And this is super neat because it allows us to pinpoint the place that the problem is or to say the problem is all over. <laughs> what you have is an infestation of walnuts. Um, so we're trying to find where that one walnut snuck in to our chocolate chip pancakes. Okay. And what we'll do is we'll test each path or each parameter that we're trying to constrain to make equal and figure out which ones we can't make equal. And this is where we get into the doing the small t cups. Okay. So this is called partial invariance because it's partially invariant. Some items work, some items don't. Okay. Uh, and how many things can not work before you decide that it's over and done? No rules here. I would say the the you know if it takes half the items on the scale for you to make a partially invariant model, it's not a very good model. If it's one or two or a couple, you know, if you have 50 items, it might not be surprising that one or two of them don't work quite the same way. Okay. If you have 10 and four of them don't work the same way, then you have a different issue. So no hard and fast rules here on how many ones you are allowed to let be partially invariant. Okay. I would just say use good judgment here. And so what we do is we have this invariance criteria, we have the previous step, and we're trying to bring our current step, wherever it broke down, so let's say it broke down on scalar, we're trying to bring it up to an invariant level for metric. So the minimum number of, of things that we can um, say don't work to bring this model up and say, okay, these are the ones that don't appear to work, but everything else seems to work okay. These are the ones we had to let them do whatever they wanted. And we'll see an example of this today to, to like hopefully solidify this. 
And you want to do that in as few items as possible because remember, invariance is a good thing. All right, so how do I test for partial invariance? Well, we could use modification indices, and for a long time, this is how I taught this until Levon like flips, flips some like little switch in the background that no longer allowed you to see the modification indices between groups. So then there was this cool measurement invariance function in the sim tools package, which then the guy totally rewrote for reasons I don't know and I'm still mad about. And then there was this, there is still this really cool package called equal test MI for equal test measurement invariance, but and I taught it that way before, and I have YouTube videos of me doing this, and it still is available. But I have gotten enough emails from people trying to do this that it doesn't run. <laughs> that I think it's probably best to teach you how to do this straight through Levon because you generally it's easier to troubleshoot. So while I like all these packages. I, I've changed this lecture from before because they break enough that it's clear that I just want to stick with what's in Levon. Right. So we will not use modification indices. We will test this by doing a loop. Heaven forbid we're going to do a loop in R, but we'll change one item at a time because it might be that that one item is the only one you need to fix. And we'll slowly add items. We'll loosen them up. It's called uh, uh, freeing the parameter. Because when you do the multigroup part, you constrain them to equal. You set these equality constraints uh, using just uh, another argument in the CFA. So it's really nice. It's pretty easy. Uh, so you can set them all to equal. And then there's one more argument where you can say, well, all of them but this one. And so we'll slowly add one item at a time until. If it works, the previous step and the current step are equal. Okay. And by equal, I mean 0.01 or less change. The last thing we can do before we get into this example is to test latent means. So after I determine, like, here's the invariance for this model, I can also calculate these latent means and use basically a, t -t a literal t-test to determine if they're different by groups. Because it could be that they're mostly equivalent, but overall one group has a slightly higher score than the other. And that's a little bit easier than doing, than doing all these population heterogeneity steps, although you can actually do those heterogeneity steps. Okay, well, I'll just show you the t-test way. <clears throat> At minimum, is helpful to know how to how to transfer, how to calculate these weighted scores for each participant or each data point, because um, you could be using those scores for something. With the warning that the tricky part is converting them back into the original scale of the data. Latent means are standardized, so you get them in like z-score format. So we have to un-z-score them basically. And I'll show you at the end of this lecture in code how how close it gets to the real data. All right. So here's the argument that I thought was on my slides earlier, but here it is. So we normally use our EFA CFA procedure to show you that these questions have these nice loadings and these questions load together. And when we know that these loadings vary, some are, you know, they're all considered loading, but for some of them that might be 0.4 and for some of them that might be 0.9 and then we just totally ignore it. <laughs> and we just create these subtotals or these averages, uh, ignoring that these loadings are different. Right. And I would say that that is unfortunate because we're losing a lot of information of the, the strength of the item relationship to the latent variable. Right. So why lose that information if I don't have to? With the caveat that I think I don't know how much I expect each loading to perfectly replicate between samples. Right? So the real reason why people don't do these sort of weighted scores all the time is because you know one EFA will say that the loading is 0.7 and the other one will say it's 0.9. Which one do you use? Right? 
if you have extremely large samples, I would say that they're probably going to be pretty consistent. Um, but because of sampling variety and the just sort of natural distribution of these, it's not like the loading is 0.9, right? It's probably, you know, it's got a confidence interval that we've estimated it in um, that we just assume that they're all close enough to average together, um, which may not be a good assumption. So the nice thing about these models is they provide us a way to easily kind of account for those weights. Again, with the caveat that that may not hold true in the next sample. So let's try this. Um, <clears throat> with equality constraints, so just kind of a, a reminder of what this is doing in the background for you. We've talked about how you can set paths equal, right? So if I said my cheese latent variable is equal to, okay, that came out with a slash. I thought I was just escaping my stars here, but let's say it was A times theta plus A times Swiss. Okay. And what, so that means that the um, cheese variables are estimated with the same loading. The loading will be called A and then they'll be set to equal to each other. Okay. Most of the time we've done this for identification purposes, right? Holding, uh, making sure we have enough degrees of freedom left in that section of the model. And that is exactly what a multi-group model does. Um, but the cool thing is you don't have to set each one one at a time because we'd be here forever. Instead, in Levon, you just say, make them equal by group. Okay, and that's what it does in the background. And we'll see that in our summary output here in a minute. So a few packages used to do this whole procedure for you. Um, kind of like, give me all five steps at once. But honestly, they have caused more errors than they have caused happiness. So we're just going to do it with Levon. You're not really saving that much extra time, honestly, with the one function if it doesn't run. So here we are. So this will be very similar to the example that is on um, the class example for this um, week. And what we're going to use is called the RS14. This is the resiliency scale 14. It's a very popular measure of resiliency. So I know I have a lot of scales on meaning and resiliencies because I have worked on them a lot with my group, my friend's group mm -hmm. um, research lab that studies, you know, post-traumatic growth and meaning and, you know, life after natural disasters. And the nice thing about the RS14 is they have it has a lot, 14 very strong items relating to one factor. You can do this with multiple factors. We're just going to kind of keep it simple and look at our one factor here. So I've loaded that bad boy up. And what we've got is, oh, I renamed this later. Um, but so when you load this data set for the assignment, it just has ethnicity here. But we're going to examine sex right now. So we've got sex and ethnicity and all of our items. So the first thing I want to do is just clean up the data. Now you can leave these as numbers, but then on the output, it will print the numbers. <laughs> you got to remember who they are. So it's just a good general data screening cleanup rule is to label them with their actual labels. And for some reason, this data set has a three in it. So I'm going to say, you know what? I know that one is men and two is women. Um, so I'm going to just factor that variable like we did at the beginning of the semester and say one is men, two is women to give it labels and drop off, dro oops, sorry, drop that missing value. Because when I factor it, that three becomes an NA. Because I only said, here are the labels for one and two. I'll make this just a little bit bigger. There we go. So I have 500 people, and this is actually a pretty nice split to the data, a pretty fairly equal split. And it doesn't always work out this way, um, especially when doing undergraduate populations, right? Um, it tends to be more women, because this is often happening in the psych department, which tends to be a little bit more women. 
Now, our overall CFA. Something new we're going to add is this mean structure equals true. This goes in the CFA argument. And that adds those intercepts in the means to the model. And you want to start with that at the very beginning so that all the models are the same. Now, it won't actually change model fit um, to include them versus not. Uh, but you should include them for all of them so they're all the same. All right, let's build our model. This is an easy one, right? One factor model where they're all added together. So I'm going to do CFA. Okay, our models are overall model here. And that's the only model we've got to build. So unlike MTMM where we had to change the model each time, in this set of steps we're changing the CFA each time. So we, the overall model just is. Okay, it doesn't change. How, what we're going to do is change here. And I turned on mean structure equals true. So let's look at that. Okay, this is the same summary we've done all semester. That hasn't changed. Let's see what happens. Okay. First of all, is this a, uh, it, you know, our normal questions? Uh, R squared, positive, great. No error messages. Variances, positive, excellent. Standard errors, about all the same. Okay. Cool. Um, fit of the model. Okay. CFI and TLI are acceptable. Uh, RIMC's all right. It's not great, but it's all right. Below 0.10. R S M S R M R also good. Okay, we're looking good. We're looking good. How do each item? Um, how do they load to their latent variable? So we look over here. All nice and strong. That's why I love this example. It's like a very well formed scale. Cool. Now here's the new piece that we got that we don't normally see. Okay, normally you see latent variables. These are low efficient low efficiency, I'm making up words, coefficients up here. Goal, goal, goal. We normally look at our variances. This section is new. And this is literally the item average for each one of these. Okay. Now I don't know that standardized all makes a lot of sense here. This is in the scale of the data. Okay. Yeah. So they hover around slightly, I have to think about this, negatively skewed, right? There's a, a ceiling effect where the scale tends to push more towards the positive end. It's one to seven, right? Um, so we got some that are right on five. RS5 is one of the lowest ones here, but most of them around four to five. All right, easy enough. This is the stuff we've done. What's the new stuff? The other thing that I've been kind of slowly introducing, and there are so many ways to do this. This is just like one of my favorites. You can use broom if you want to clean them all up. Um, I just like making myself a nice, easy little matrix of my fit indices and printing them out because I'm usually doing this for publication purposes. But what we're going to do, um, and I've, this gets introduced in some of the assignments, is just make ourselves a table. Again, if you are like super handy with tidyverse or whatever and you can make your own model the flex table package is also like a plus skills at making cute tables okay. but we're already using knit r because we're doing this in markdown so uh the cable function and cable actually has a bunch of really cool um underlying table things and there's a cable extra package that you can use to make some really fancy looking tables so all I've done is make myself a matrix. Now matrix is just a simple um, um, structure in R that you know doesn't isn't quite a data frame. It's just like give me nine rows and six columns, and I'm gonna fill them in. Okay. I set up my column names. So I've got my model, my chi square, my degrees of freedom, CFI, RIMC, SRMR. I could also add TLI if I wanted to. I'm mostly going to focus here on the CFI column. And then just start adding labels. This is row one. Row one, overall model. And then add all these fit indices. So this here is just the, the code to grab all those functions, all those fit numbers. So overall, first model, pretty good. 
And I'm using three decimals when I round specifically because of our subtraction rules for CFI. And then last but not least, always make yourself a picture. This is where I'm going to stop with the pictures because basically it's the same picture over and over again. But the, the thing I want to highlight that's different on this picture versus the other pictures is now we're going to see these little triangles. Okay, the triangles represent the uh, intercepts. Now I've asked for the completely standardized solution, so the average score of a latent variable will always be zero because it's basically z-scored because we've abstracted away from the scale. So a person who has a resiliency score of one is above the mean, one standard deviation above the mean. There's an assumption of a normal distribution there. And then these here are standardized. So this, I wish you could mix and match here because knowing them in the original scale of the data is more useful for the means, but these are the standardized means. All right, now, how do I do this for just men in this example? Simplest solution is either create yourself a new data set or just do some subsetting right here. So I just said, you know what, give me only the rows where the sex is men. And let's look at that model. I will, bore, I will not bore you by checking all of the rules for each model, but you should. Um, and let's just kind of look at the fit. Roughly the same. Okay, maybe a little different. Not too bad. And these, I usually also kind of check the loadings. So there, it's not suddenly like all of these are two or something. Okay, I'm expecting sevens and eights because that's what I saw in my overall model. And that's what I see here too. And so effectively, you just want to make sure this doesn't blow up. Okay, it doesn't run, gives you a Haywood case, looks wildly different. Let's try women. Their fit is a little less, okay. so that might give us some indication of that something's going to be different for women versus men. Okay. Fit's a little less great, um, but, and I might start to see why. Okay, so our standardized loadings are a little bit lower over here, so maybe the loading section might be where this breaks, but it could also be in the error terms too. Maybe we're just not estimating um, women as well. They have more variance. But that's the question that we're about to answer. So it didn't blow up. Everything looks okay. Let's just stick both of those in our table. And comparing them directly now, we can see, you know, they're not wildly different. It's not like one of them is 0.9 and the other one is 0.3. And so that's really where you want to look, where there's this like a big gap between the models. I'm not comparing these on their CFIs because these are, are not really comparable. Okay. Two different groups of people. So here, the first steps is just make sure that the model isn't terrible. And hope for the best. So this looks good. Let's see what happens now. Now for, for, for configural invariance, this is where we start pancaking things together. And the pancake option or nesting is controlled here under group. And that's all you have to do. It's the same model. I mean, give it a different name over here, right? But I don't change anything in this CFI section, uh, CFI. I don't change anything in the overall model where I write the Levon code. I'm only changing things here in the CFA function. And so all of this is the same. Add one new line, group equals sex. And that is beautiful. That's all it takes. Pancakes them together. So let's see what happens. How do you tell? Ah, here we go. It tells us how many people are in each group. Our degrees of freedom will now have doubled because we basically have two groups, two models on top of each other. It tells you the fit for each group separately, um, or the, the test statistic for each group, which mostly you ignore, and you come down here and we get this overall global fit. Not bad. Okay. All within acceptable ranges. The TLI can be a little better. All of our you know, these are looking pretty good. Get it all above 0.3. Um, where else do I look here? Um, this is women. Sorry, I didn't make that clear up here. This is women. This is men. 
but it gives you one overall fit statistic. So it essentially takes that women model and that men model and just kind of puts them together. So why run the two separate models first? Well, it's, uh, you know, it forces you to focus on like one of them at a time, <laughs> essentially, and look, you get the fit and see separate for each model. And so the fit and see separately, one's good and one's really bad. That's where you kind of stop and you just sort of explore why one of them is way worse. Okay, what modification to see is there? Is there a Haywood case? Like, why is this group performing much worse than this other group? So then I stuck that in my table. Just adding a new row here. And notice here the degrees of freedom are double. Basically, we've just added these two models together. Not basically, literally. <laughs> here it essentially is, it's effectively an average of the, the overall fit indices. All right, now let's start actually doing some comparisons. So at this point, we haven't used our CFI rule at all because it's not yet really wanting to compare them. Um, but from here out, we'll do this comparison. So we've got our pancakes, they're on the same plate. Now let's start um, slowly reining them in and forcing them to be the exact same pancake. So we'll add a, me a metric invariance. So the way that you do this, again, only in the CFA, we've got a group equals sex, and you add this line here. So you say group dot equal, force the quality constraints on just the loadings. And this is why I try to keep the terms, the metric invariance term is sort of the brown terminology. So other people use this too, but I think it kind of attributed to Brown because he wrote a textbook on it. Um, but practically in Levon terms, this is the loadings. And notice here, number of free parameters. Now we've got number of equality constraints. There are 14 items in the resiliency scale, but it forced 13 of them to be the same because we've set one to one okay, for identification purposes. So we'll scroll down. So this looks pretty similar, so maybe it didn't blow up. And it would be hard to tell, like looking through the output. I usually just kind of glance through the output and make sure I don't see anything weird. But I do want to show you what it's actually doing. And so this code here, this tells you what it's named that parameter. So it named this P2. Okay, so <laughs> it's not, it's, it basically is P2, P3, P4, right? Um, P14, it just doesn't print the whole thing. And that is equal to P2 down here. Okay. So you'll see the loading here is 0.749. I'm sorry, it sets these parts equal. It sets the estimates equal. So 1.32, 1.232. Okay. Now, standardized at the moment, they're going to be different because we haven't set any of the variance is equal or anything. So they're going to have slightly different standard errors um, and other variances in different places. So we get slightly different totally standardized solution. You'll see them kind of come together as we make more and more equal here. But what's being set to equal here is the estimate itself. But because of the standardization procedure, we will get slightly different numbers out of here. We force them to be the same. What happened? Well, this is why I like to make the table. <laughs> um, you can use ANOVA here, but I really recommend against it because that chi-square test is like pretty sensitive. So I don't even look at it anymore. Um, I'm going to compare this CFI directly to this one. And they are exactly the same. So it did not hurt us to constrain the model to have the same loadings. That implies that the men and women's loadings are effectively equal. This is kind of backwards null hypothesis testing, right? We're, we're testing if they're equal. Are close enough to equal that the models still fit the same. Now the interesting thing here is that you actually gain degrees of freedom, but I think confuses people until you remember that we're forcing men and women's loadings to be the same. So we went from estimating men's and estimating women's to estimating one. So that is 13, per, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 13 parameters we got back. 
because we're estimating them all as one. It's 13 because there's 14 questions and one of them is set to one. So 13 items we get back. And this is usually where I can tell if someone has done this right or wrong. So when I'm reviewing these sorts of papers, um, I always look at their degrees of freedom because this is where you can tell if someone has done something wrong. Like, okay, we well had 15 items and you gained 30 degrees of freedom. You did something wrong. Or you're not telling us something in the background here. Oh yeah, we used weighted least squares. Oh, well, that's good to know. You should have said that at the beginning. Okay, so this is true if we're using maximum likelihood and you're not using any kind of ordered analysis. And okay, we're gonna talk about that idea of an ordered analysis in a couple weeks. Okay, we're doing good. Step, one more step. Let's add in the item intercepts. Again, super easy, just add intercepts right here. Now we've gained um, 14 items back because we don't have to set any of the intercepts to one, so it's 14 different intercepts. And we're gonna force those to be equal. So you'll see now it's saying, ah, oh, these parameters are now equal. So the estimate, 4.8. 4.86. All right. So, next question. Are these the same? Well, I've stuck this in my table. Obviously, it's, something's going to go wrong here because I'm about to be done with my last model and I have a couple more lines. <laughs> but, can you stop, please? Thank you. <clears throat> Let's compare this number here to here. That is a change of 0 0.007, okay, which is less than 01. So we would consider these equivalent. We have to kind of math here, but 0 0.007 is within our range of acceptable change. So we'd move on to the next step. If any of these steps break, you should actually stop and do partial invariance. In the assignment, I'm just going to have you run all the steps in order just to get you used to doing it. Let's try strict. Let's see what happens. Okay, so now are all the item residuals, are all the error terms the same? Okay, we just add that to our list that we've got going, our vector here that we've got going. So loadings, intercepts, residuals. We gained another 14 of them back. And now... We will see that we um, that it added the these as also estimated as the same. So the variance here is estimated at 1.887 for men. It's also women, men and women. It's the same. We have now set nearly every parameter to be equivalent in this model. Is it any good? Well, obviously not. Otherwise, this wouldn't be a good example. Right, so 0 0.902 minus 0 0.888, and this is why I, you know, R is a giant calculator. So let's do that. <laughs> yeah, man, it is late. Okay. 0.014. So I'm missing out. Okay. This would be considered a non-equivalent change. So what I'm going to try to do is find a parameter or parameters that get me up to the acceptable amount of change. So I'm trying to get myself to a model that has a CFI of at least 0.892 because that's an acceptable level of change. If I go over that, that's okay, but that's sort of the minimum bar that I'm trying to get to because that's within my acceptable change. All right, now how to do that. And this is where the other older packages were really handy, but you know, loops are not that hard in R, so we're just gonna write ourselves a little loop. Okay. So we can see in our last step here that we have a difference in models based on this change in CFI, so there are some items that have different residuals. Okay. So now I have to figure out where that problem is and update the model to fix that problem. Okay. So you only look for problems in the step you're in. For this example, that's the residuals. Residuals are written with two tildes for variance. So we're gonna look for problems with two tildes. So what are the other steps, just so that when one of them breaks, you know? Okay. For metric variables, 
uh, the metric step, it's equals tilde. So like RS equals tilde, RS1, that sort of thing. For a scalar, this is kind of new. We haven't done this at all. It's tilde one, which is actually the same code as linear models, right? So if I did y tilde one, that's basically estimate the average of y for me. And for the strict step, we do double tildes for our variances. Okay. So then I'm just going to do the leave one out principle, change one of them at a time, and calculate the CFI and see where I can get to. So to do that, I wrote myself some code here. And I wrote, okay, so for my partial syntax, I'm going to paste the column names. Okay, what is this 4 through 17? That's just where my RS columns are. Okay. So I just want to say, you know, give me RS1, RS2, RS3, RS4. This is faster than typing it all out yourself. So RS1, tilde, tilde, RS1. And so what we end up with is every possible uh, residual okay, uh, code block. So RS1 tilde tilde RS1 would say freely estimate the two groups as different for this parameter. Um, and this is, remember, from when we did our, our, one, our model with the Haywood case, this is how we set the variance. Right, so we did RS1 tilde tilde 10 times RS1 or whatever the number was. And so here we're just saying allow this one to do whatever it wants. It can be different between groups. Everything else is equal, but this one, keep it the same. Allow them to be different. And so all, oh, 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 I got excited. Um, all I've done here is create myself a vector of all the possibilities. The more possibilities you have, the longer this will take to run because we're going to run 14 different models. And that's what this loop does. It says, okay, I am going to run as many models as there are possibilities. So this just counts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is 14 different models. I'm going to label them um, with which possibility it is so later I can figure out which one's best. So instead of it being like number one, number seven, I can, it'll say RS7 for me. And then I'm just going to loop over it and I'm going to do it. Okay. So this for I and length, one to length partial syntax, all this is doing is saying, okay, for the first one, run a CFA. For the second one, run a CFA. So we could cut and paste this code, but that's how this loop works, is it just runs that model over and over again. And what it does is it changes out which one is released. Okay, it's free, freely estimated. So <clears throat> group.partial here is our new code piece. And group.partial says, okay, estimate these as all equal except this one. Let that one do whatever it wants. You could do more than one, but in our case, we're going to do one at a time here. And so we've slowly added one new line or one new piece to our CFA with each one. So I run that CFA and then I just save the CFI. Okay, that's not confusing to say at all. I run that model, I save that fit indice, and then I just perm all out at the end. And so this represents the CFI if I allow that parameter to be free. So this is the model where that um, residual is different for men and women. Everything else is the same but this one residual. And you can see it's kind of like slightly up and down. And so to keep myself from squinting through a whole bunch of numbers, you can use this cool function called which max. Which max tells you which one has the highest CFI because that's the, the one that might get us the closest. Okay, and it's the RS9. That'll bring our CFI up to 0.89. A minute ago I said we need 0.892, so it's not quite enough, but maybe in combination with another one, we'll get it. So let's start there with that one. So that's how we find which one it is. Now we just run it. So I call this strict fit two because it's part two. I take my original model 
and I add this group dot partial and I just cut and pasted that RS9 tilde tilde stuff from the last slide. There's a lot of output as usual. There's so much output. Levon is just stands for long, long output right. for both models. And I want to show you that they're estimated different. That's the whole point here. So RS9 for women here at the top, I think. Yes, women at the top uh, is two. Okay, so the variance here is two. So that's two points above and below four. So for women, they on average are scoring between two and six. What is it for men? It's only one. So they're scoring the same average. Okay, four point. Um, I thought it was 4.6. Oh, I read the wrong line. It's 4.2, isn't it? My bad. Yes. Okay, so for women, it's 4.2. So they're scoring between 2.2 and 6.2. You know, one standard deviation above and below. For men, though, that variance is half. And that's really interesting. So they're scoring the same score, 4.2, but they're only scoring between 3 and 5. So women are more variable in their answering to that particular question, which of course I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. Okay. So women give a the wider, they're more heterogeneous in their answer to that question than men. Add that bad boy to my table. Strict model. I'm so close. It actually rounds up to 0.891. Now I'm going to compare 0.891 here to 0.902. It's so close. <laughs> But close doesn't count here. So let's look for one more. Maybe there's one more that'll put me over the edge, so to speak. So I'm gonna run that exact same code. Okay. But here's the thing that I'm gonna do a little bit differently. Okay. And I actually am gonna act, uh, do RS9 again, and that's fine. If you repeat it twice, it doesn't do anything. Um, but I've added RS9. So this is the key here, put the star um, right here. Uh, we need to take the model we just ran and make sure it's the one that goes into here. Okay. Otherwise, we're just testing it against our regular strict step and not accounting for the fact that we updated this model. So I just copied that code one more time. Not the whole thing because the other the uh, starting code block doesn't need to be repeated. It's the loop, but I've updated my loop. So now, which max, as long as it's not RS9 again, right, you can you can take that one out if you if you want. But here it's telling me that RS13 is the answer. That one brings me up to the highest point. I think with which max you can ask ask it for the second highest one. So if it tells you the same parameter again, obviously you can't do the same parameter twice. So um, say okay, give me the second one in the list. You could also just do sort on this if you'd like. But RS13 is the next one. Well, let's add that one in. Okay. So I've just added it to here. So you just keep it in the little in the concatenate function here. You can say, okay, do both of these. All right, and so let's see what happens. Women, two points here. Again, men, one point. So on these two items, women are more heterogeneous and they're answering the men. Okay, so we go and we look up those items and see if we can understand why. Now, does that get me somewhere magical? And it does. Okay. So again, I'm comparing this 0.89 to the scalar step. So we always compare it to the last invariant step. Okay. And so I would say this model um, is partially invariant. So I'm able to bring it up. It's, it's all but these two items. And then I think about what that means. Okay, so let's summarize that. So it's mostly invariant. The structure, loading, and intercepts are invariant. All but two of the error variances are the same for men and women. I would say that you can interpret the total scores for, for men and women fairly equally. But there's a good um, understanding here that women are going to be slightly more heterogeneous on these two items. Okay. So that just means that they're 
um, answering is slightly more, they use more of the range of the scale. And here are those two items. I keep interested in things, and my life has meaning. So women are much more likely to pick higher and lower here than men, which is interesting. Last thing that we're going to look at, slide in right on time here, is the latent, vari uh, the latent means. So I can actually use my final model here, strict three, and have it predict. So based on the model, what are the predicted um, answers on these scales, on these items? So from this model, spit out a data frame that represents the individual item answers. So that's what this type equals OV, observed variables. Now, unfortunately, the way it spits this out is quite yucky. So I essentially have to say, take, it comes out as a, as a, a list. So I can use rbind to put those two back together. And then it, it does women first. How do I know it does women first? Because we've looked at the output and it put women at the top. So I can add back in um, the uh, group labels here. So the first 266 are women and the last 244 are men. I know that because of my table. There is a, they do give an example in the help guides about how to merge it with the original data frame, but it is not pretty. <laughs> And so what I've done here is it just um, created, uh, so I have this data frame. So here's all the original predicted scores. Now, literally, the participant data is like three, four, five, two, three, four, right? This is the predicted score, you know, sort of given the model. So it's obviously not perfect since it doesn't actually guess three, four, five. But I also just made a sum. So let's just add them all up. Um, and what do we get? Well, what we find is that men and women have very similar latent means if I predict the observed scores. So this here represents uh, me recreating the actual data that we might get from participants. Okay, With the caveat, again, that these are um, not, they don't match how people actually answer these scales. They, they pick three or they pick four. They don't pick 3.8. So hang on to these numbers, 63 and 64. I don't normally do it this way. Instead, we normally do the factor scores. Okay. That's a proof that our model, this is the model, 63 and 64, matches the data. This is the actual data. The average score from the actual data is 63 and 64. So our model matches pretty good. That's why our fit indices are good. If instead I say, okay, print me the latent means. Just give me the mean. I don't need to sum anything up. Right? I believe you. <laughs> These scores match. Okay. Uh, no OV, basically. So here I'm going to do the same thing. This do call, R bind them together. Okay. Add in my categorical variable. Let's calculate again. Well, um, this time it tells me that they're these weird numbers. So don't forget that the latent means are calculated on a normalized scale. So there's these scores. So I got to convert that back to my real data so that I can interpret this. But, you know, on average, women are very close to average and men are slightly below average. But this is such a small difference that I don't think I would call this anything useful. So we say, okay, t apply to, to get the original score, we take the means times the standard deviation. Now I just did this on the real data because our model is very, very good. Okay. So I just calculated, I just did this on the real data, but there's a way to do this um, with a lot of predicted data as well, but it's just as easy if your model's good because you're basically saying the data and the model match. So take that latent mean times its 
um, standard deviation plus it's the mean of the data. Okay, so this just converts the z-score back into the same average of the data. I could use this to calculate it on another scale's average too. So, you know, on on RS14, that scale is going to be 64, 63 and 64, but on the BRS scale, which is a totally different one, um, it's going to be 10, 10 and 11. Okay, so this allows us just to convert it back to the scale of the original data. And they're all very similar. So from law of predict, I got 63.47. I'm sorry, from the real data, I got 63.47. From predicting from the factor means, I got 62.3 okay, and 64. From estimating on the observed variables, I got 63 and 64. So just kind of showing you that it, they're very close. Last step, almost done is to calculate your favorite statistic. Okay. You can do this. I did this on the um, predicted latent variable scores. I could do this on the real scores since I know they're all very similar. Um, and I use the moat library here, disclaimer, I wrote this library. <laughs> so I'm kind of partial to it. But it allows you to calculate effect sizes and, um, and the t-test all at the same time. So I'm using a lot of T apply here. And you can send me a note if you don't remember how T apply works, but basically you put in the dependent variable, the categorical split variable, and then the function you want to do. So this is how you can calculate the mean by groups, okay. the standard deviation by groups, and the length by groups. And then the function we're going to use here is d.independent T, okay, because these are independent groups. Men and women are different people. Mean 1, mean 2, standard deviation 1, standard deviation 2, and 1 and 2, alpha is 0.05. And this actually prints out in LaTeX. So it looks pretty on, um, on uh, research reports. But it tells us our effect size difference is 0.05. Oh, where have we seen that? Well, if I subtract this one from that one, I get that same difference. Because these are standardized, and that's what Cohen's D is. <laughs> this is kind of the z-score form of the difference. Um, and that confidence interval out here tells me, though, that that zero is a likely value. So it ranges from 0.22 to 0.13. That, that um, interval includes zero, so they're probably not different. And then if I needed a t-test to statistically confirm this, they're very not different. Okay, that p-value is way above anybody's favorite cutoff score. Okay. So these two are, I would say, um, Pretty much they have the same latent mean. Even though we have these slight differences in heterogeneity, that doesn't seem to affect the um, final output. All right, let's summarize all that up. What have we learned? This is a lot at once, right? So all the terminology. We've talked about loadings and variances all year, so now we're just kind of putting new lab shiny labels on those. Okay. So I often we'll forget which one's metric and which one's scalar and I open up these notes and I go okay loadings um, intercepts residuals okay. how to actually run one of these models so we just slowly make them more and more restrictive how to calculate partial invariance and that just involves um, kind of looping over and seeing which one the sort of leave one out principle which one is the best okay. and then how to say okay this is either invariant or not, and how does that affect our, our final total score that we actually use for statistical inference? Okay, and in that case, there, there is none. There's no difference. So, <coughs> excuse me. All that together, multi-group models. Um, and the class assignment for this week is the same scale, the RS scale, so you can use a lot of this code, cutting and pasting, uh, tested on ethnicity. So it works for men and women, but does it work the same way for um, black and white populations?